but he's also a mensch. Uh, a good guy who has his head on straight in terms of all the issues in this room that people care about so much about. As a state representative from the South, South Framingham and Ashland area, Tom is the chair of the Joint Committee of Education. He's previously served as chair of the Committee of Higher Education and vice chair of the Committee for Children, Family, and Persons with Disabilities, uh, with disabilities and more. Tom has been a dogged, champ, passionate champion of individual disabilities. As the chief sponsor of the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Program in Real Life Bill, which you'll hear about more, right? Uh, as the chair of the Special Ed and Disabilities Caucus, and as a lead sponsor of the bill that led to the Transition Specialist Endorsement, which we're celebrating today. Representative Senator Kendro was chaired the school <laughs> committee in his hometown of Ashland, and who, by the way, was a write-in candidate uh, when he was elected 10 years ago, understands disabilities from more than a professional angle. He's the father of Dave, a grown son with Down syndrome, Throughout Dave's school years, Tom fought for inclusion, ultimately succeeding in swaying the district to shift its policy regarding the integration of students with disabilities. As a lawyer, Tom has fought for families to ensure that their children with disabilities receive the transition planning and services to which they were entitled. As a representative, he's moved the state forward in policy. And as a dad, he has a perspective to get what this is really all about. I'm delighted to introduce Representative Tom Sanitary. Thank you, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today and to have been invited um, by Arlen and by Leslie University. So I want to thank them for, for inviting me here. Um, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your Saturday and missing the, the duck boat Red Sox parade <laughs> to be here to talk about and to think about opportunities for students with intellectual disabilities and how we move them from the K-12 system into adulthood. And so I don't see Arlen that often and I don't talk to her that often. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a case that we worked on together later today but as I showed up today, I got here early and the, my instructions were to call Arlen on her cell phone and to tell her I was here. And when I called her, Arlen has a very, very distinct voice <laughs> on the phone. And when I talked to her, you know how you eat something or taste something or smell something and memories come flooding back to you? The hello on the phone brought it all back to me <laughs> and brought the importance of transition planning and I'll talk about the case we worked on. The case we worked on was very difficult. It was groundbreaking. It was one of the cases that I've handled in the past that I really didn't think we had a chance of winning. Um, and I think we always had that on the way through the process, but we did, and I'll talk to you about that later. Um, so I do want to thank you all for being here. I try to talk to you folks, or try to talk to some folks before I came, before I came up here to understand <coughs> who you all are out there. I did get some sense, but I'm going to ask some questions. How many of you are teachers? Well, that's a big crowd. And, and how many are in our therapists of whatever kind? How about guidance counselors? And how many of you are administrators? So we've got quite a selection there. How many are parents? How many are parents and something else? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, we've now covered about everybody. And how, how about how many are students here? How many are students looking at transition programs? Great. Thank you for being here. So what I want to talk about today, hopefully, is I want to talk about a, just hit on a few points. One is how we ended up here from a historical perspective. And I think it's important for us all to think about what is the history that brought us here. I was talking to some people in the audience that are around my age, and um, we lived through the history of special education. We've lived through this whole change. We've been part of the change. It's been an exciting time, um, but we still have a long way to go. But I want to sort of place that historically. Um, 
the other thing is, why me? Why am I up here? And uh, maybe at the end of this, you'll still wonder that. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll tell my story to, so that you can understand where I'm coming from. I'm also going to talk about the genesis of the, um, the um, <coughs> transition bill and how that came to be, sort of briefly, but to, to get into it, just so you can understand how that, that bill came to be. And I'm also going to mention or talk about two new initiatives that are happening at the state level that could be substantial changes in the law that may affect the folks in this room and what you do. So the first part is, how did we get here historically? And I think historically, and, and you know, I'm, I know I'm talking to the preaching to the choir here, and, and you guys probably know more about this than I do. But one of the things that, that happened in Massachusetts was clearly a leader in this. And um, how many of you grew up in Massachusetts? That's good. Now I can ask some <coughs> trivia questions. How many remember Boomtown and Rex Trailer? Woohoo! <laughs> yes. And for those of you that don't know or are too young to know, you can go on YouTube and watch it. <laughs> um, so Rex Trailer was a cowboy, he was a TV cowboy, and he had this kid show. And on Rex Trailer's show, they did, they did all sorts of things. One of the things they did is that the kids would come through, and they were called this posse or something, and they would all come through and wave to the camera. And it was just a local TV show that was broadcast and done here in Boston. And you know, as a kid growing up in the 50s and 60s, we loved Boomtown because it was really because it was not much else on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rex Trailer had this show, and it was really just a goofy, goofy show with a, you know, there was a cowboy, and then there was a uh, Pablo was his sidekick. The whole thing was very goofy, but fun, and we liked it. One of the issues for Rex Trailer was that they did not allow kids with disabilities to come through that little thing and wave their hands and wave to the audience. They also said the producers wouldn't allow a student with a, or a kid with a disability to actually be shot on camera. So the kids with disabilities weren't shown. Um, at that time, for those of you who who grew up here, um, we had, and we still have, unfortunately, state institutions where people with intellectual disabilities are housed. Um, in the 50s and in the 60s, and even in the 70s, people who had a baby with a significant disability who was identified at birth were given the option to put their child in one of these institutions. Um, my son has Down syndrome. Down syndrome was one of the key issues because at birth, you know the child has Down syndrome. It's an easily identified condition. So a lot of times doctors felt the, the, the typical thing was do yourself and your family a favor and your child a favor too. It was not, it was not anything against, you know, what the parents weren't doing anything wrong, they were doing what they thought was best, was to give the child up and have the child grow up in the institution because the institution knew what to do and how to serve these kids. Those of us that are also students of history know that that didn't happen and that the, the life in the institutions was miserable. As a matter of fact, here at Fernald, um, they actually did uh, science experiments on the kids. That the Quaker Oats Company actually <coughs> wanted to know about the absorption, uh, absorption of iron in oatmeal, so they actually radioactive um, oatmeal and fed it to the kids. And so there was, it was just a miserable history. But back to Rex Trailer. <laughs> Rex Trailer obviously was aware of all of this. He was aware of the problems in his, on his TV show, and he wanted to do something. So what he did, and I told you he was a cowboy, he <coughs> decided he needed something to happen here in Massachusetts, that kids like this in Massachusetts <coughs> needed a break and needed education and needed their families all needed support from the state government and from the public. So what he did was he had a wagon train from the Berkshires to Beacon Hill to the State House. A real wagon train with covered wagons and he was in his costume and um, it was actually sponsored by Ark Mass or the Ark of uh, wherever the Ark was from at that point. Um, and he traveled across the state giving the state the message like look at these kids they need an opportunity. Look at these families. They need an opportunity. 
That's what happened. That was the beginning here in Massachusetts. In 1972, with maybe even some folks in this room, it's amazing. I'm always amazed how young those people were that enacted this law. We enacted the first special education law in the country here in Massachusetts. We were first here in Massachusetts <coughs> in the agenda. And what our special education law said, which is going to be it's shocking to, to people now, is that every student in Massachusetts had the right to an education. Every student. No matter what your ability or disability, you had a right to an education. But the law went even further than that. The law said not only do you have a right to an education, you have the right to be educated with typically developing peers in the same setting as them. Because they knew that's what made a difference. <coughs> the historical perspective that that comes from is there was movement at that time um, in the early 60s and 70s, for those of you that remember, that was a huge period of disruption in all sorts of fronts. We had the war in Vietnam, we had student activism, we had the women's movement first was coming on the, the, the scene. We even had animal rights was coming on the scene. Um, and this was part of that larger movement. Um, one of the things too in the area of education, in the 50s we had Brown versus the Board of Education. A dramatic case that said you cannot have separate but equal education. Separate is not equal. The Supreme Court of the United States said that and part of the thinking and part of the draft of this law was to get rid of that separate but equal in education for people with special needs or people that need special education services. Like I said that was 72. The federal government, seeing the wisdom of us here in Massachusetts, followed in 76 with the uh, IDEA and created that law to be the law in the United States. So 40 years. 40 years. Why we're here today is because we did that 40 years ago. What happened, and for many of you in this room, who have been part of that movement, have educated more than a generation of students with, with special needs. And the results are why we're here. These students have now become empowered because they got the education that everybody else did. They got the education that you folks delivered to them, giving them the opportunity and the ability to self-advocate for themselves, <coughs> or to advocate for themselves, the ability to make change. And the, the issue of saying, look it, when I'm reaching 12th grade, I have the same hopes and aspirations as my, for myself as everybody else does. I have big dreams for myself. And they had those big dreams, or they have those big dreams because of the work you did and because of the work the policy makers did in drafting this special education law. But what's happened now when we have more than a generation, and it did take a long time to sort of get that through or get the, uh, the process through, I'll talk a little bit about my own story in that experience. Um, the issue is that we now have these students say, where do I go to next? The traditional model was the substantially separate model, where students came through the system, and at that point, if you're in a substantially separate model, it's not quite so graded, so there's not quite the delineation of 18 to 22, because you're just kind of moving along in the system. But once you become included, it becomes clear to the student and to their families that they are on some kind of a trajectory that seems to end at, at 18 or when they reach the 12th grade. So parents and students, when they reach the 12th grade, see everybody moving on to something else, and they're saying, okay, well, where am I going? What am I doing? We see that. We also see, and what I've seen, and what our, all our experiences, and why you're all here, is that school districts, teachers, and administrators all felt the same thing. They saw the trajectory, they see these students, they hear their demands, and they think, oh my God, what is next? Some of the conversations I've had with administrators, um, even with my own son, was the issue of what happens when you reach 12th grade. A lot of school districts felt forced to keep those kids 
essentially in 12th grade for another four years. <coughs> and they, and administrators and school districts really didn't want to do that. They just were, they didn't know what to do. So part of why we're here and why we're having this conversation is how do we get those students from being in the K-12 system to adulthood. Now the next question, which maybe should be easy for me to talk about, is why am I the guy that's telling you this story? Why am I up here? Um, and I have one reason. I'm gonna. Oh, oh, she's already clicked on it. She's already clicking through. Well, one, the, the big reason I'm here is because I'm a dad. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow through my story. I'm going to see where I am for time on this thing. I've got my clock, so I don't know what it's time. 20, it's 20 to 10. You just go. Time. Keep going. So uh, I'm a dad. And David was born, actually, um, he's 29 now. Um, when he was born, my wife and I were 28. Um, we met in college. And we met at Holy Cross. And we actually, even though we met at Holy Cross and we had some of the same classes, we actually didn't even know each other. Maybe we didn't find each other that remarkable at the time. <laughs> um, but we were in a psychology class in the 80s. Um, not in the 80s, it was in the 70s, unfortunately. <laughs> and they talked about, it was this intro to psychology, and it was a big lecture hall, something like this. So there was a lot of things happening. Um, but the, um, what we learned about was in education, what at the time they were called mainstreaming. So in the, this was pretty much the early mid-70s. They were talking about mainstreaming and how it was the law and all this. So they were obviously looking at the Massachusetts law at the time. My son was born in 1984. Um, and then by the time he was time to go to kindergarten, um, and we, he had a great you know, beginning. Everything was fine. Um, the family was fine. There was obviously a, an initial huge adjustment for me and my wife, but especially for me, I thought at least in the first year as we moved ahead and sort of adjusted to the, to the process of, of being his parents. Um, but when it came time for him to go to kindergarten, at that time there was no thought or concept to include in a kid before kindergarten. There was early intervention and then there was sort of this limbo <laughs> period, bless you. Um, but there was really no thought of it. So, because we were sort of looking at David as every other kid and just realizing, oh, it's time for him to kindergarten, be a kindergarten. So, we went down to the kindergarten and talked to the principal and said, oh, yeah, we're ready to enroll our kid here because obviously me and my wife being the geniuses we were, went to the psych class, we knew they were mainstreaming kids. So we showed up at our kindergarten class in, uh, or kindergarten school in uh, Ashland and said, oh, yeah, we're here. Um, we have a son, David, He's, he has Down syndrome and we're ready to enroll him in kindergarten. And the principal's first reaction was, yeah, no. This isn't the school for him. You shouldn't, you shouldn't educate him here. This isn't an appropriate placement for him. And the, the initial reaction was, you know, really shock and disbelief as a sort of an outsider to the process. I already knew we did this because I had already studied this. Uh, they couldn't be wrong in my psychology class. <laughs> so finally, he, um, he, after some conversations, I, my wife and I, as we go through this process, you'll get a feeling for this, but my wife and I are like this tag team in this process. She's not here today, but she's coming, she's flagging later today. I was good cop, she was bad cop. <laughs> That's how we got anything done. So I was always good cop. Occasionally, I would switch to bad cop, and that was very, very bad on that one. <laughs> uh, so my wife was pushing the principal at that time, saying, no, no, we need him to go to the school. Finally, he reneged and said, okay, he can go to the school. I'll show you his classroom. He brings us through the school, this long, long walk down the hall as we go past every kindergarten class. And ultimately, we end up in this last class, which is in the corner of the building, where all the students that need special ed services are. And he was really proud, because he had now you know, saved, answered my wife's concern and said, here's the class that your son can have now. And my wife said, you don't get it. <laughs> We want him to be in one of those other classes. And I think that was, the, that was really what, what kind of pushed us through and tried to, tried to move this. The end result of that conversation in that day was we knew we were into, uh, you know, we had a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, 
But we took this approach. One of the things was I was a lawyer, so everybody thought I knew special education law, which I was able to bluff my way through. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but ultimately what we did is we took the approach of sort of lobbying, and we lobbied the principal, the administration, uh, the special ed department, and we actually got a woman in the special ed department who thought it was a good idea. And through her efforts and our efforts, um, David did enter that school in a regular classroom and was the first student in Ashland with a significant disability to enter the regular school system. So that was, for us, that was a huge thing. Um, his first grade is actually his kindergarten teacher and his first grade teacher were awesome. And you know, I would go in, I'd see the classroom during open house and all this. They did a phenomenal job. Um, and they didn't know what they were doing. Which is, you know, why many of you are in this room is because that's the way we're forced to do things in education, right? It's like, here's your kid, do it, right? Why we're here at Leslie is how do we train people to be to have the tools to do that? Um, but the problem that I always saw was, and the issue that I always felt with Dave was that it wasn't Dave's abilities or disabilities that were ever the problem. He's really, really a talented guy, even now, you know, he's a very talented guy, and he's got a lot of ambition and a lot of good things going for him. Um, so it was never him that was the problem. There was always some level of prejudice or something that was fighting him. Um, and it, the, the prejudice, I think, that the school felt or exhibited wasn't, I never thought it was um, mean-spirited in any way. Or I think in a lot of ways they didn't even understand that they had that point of prejudice against him. You know, you, you sort of end up with this sort of paternalistic attitude to people with disabilities, and that sort of plays out in this way. But anyway, um, he did start to move through the system. And since we're talking about transition, one of the problems that we had was the transition. Every transition. Every transition from every year to every year. Um, what would happen was we would show up at the IEP meeting, and I know you all know what an IEP is. Does anybody not know what an IEP meeting is? This is the room I can use the acronyms. Um, we'd show up at the IEP meeting, and I know that the, the administration and the student and the, and the teachers would all look at us like with shock, like, oh my god, they're back. <laughs> Why are they still here? Um, and, and so that process, and it was challenging. And I, you know, on their side, to, the, you know, they didn't know what to do with this kid. He was the first one coming through the system. The whole concept of inclusion, even though we were so far after the law, was still very, very challenging for school districts. And a lot of school districts were pushing against it. So nobody knew what to do when we continued on. I'm gonna, so what happened is, ultimately, and we had some real contention, like real contention, like if those of you that are administrators or teachers in a system, um, we were like your worst nightmare. <laughs> we were like, and, and, and not me, because I was good cop. <laughs> My wife was. So we had a lot of contentious meetings to try to move this through. A lot of problems, you know, just, this is way off topic, but we, I had a principal, we had like a three or four hour meeting. The principal stood up screaming at us, red faced, the teachers in the room, which were who were much smarter than us, scattered. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't going well. But as, a, as an aside, that particular principal came up to me, like since I'm the elected, I don't know, maybe he was just trying to kiss up to me later on, <laughs> at, a, at a retirement party and thanked me and my wife for the work we did in changing the atmosphere in his school and forcing his teachers to include my son and to think about education in a very different way. That may have meant a lot to me, and maybe that's why he did it to kiss up to me, but I don't know. But it, I think we did, you know, it, it's difficult to change a culture. Anyway, where am I going with this story? Oh, uh, ultimately, I'll just try to breeze through this part. Ultimately, what happened when he reached sixth grade, um, everything had fallen apart because of this sort of transition problem we had every year. And, um, the teacher that he had that year actually cried during the IEP meeting saying, don't send him on to sixth grade. 
And I thought, when the teacher's crying, don't send them on because the, the teacher at the sixth grade didn't want them at all. Um, we acquiesced and said, okay, well, we're not gonna do this. So we sent them out of district to a collaborative program in the next town, a completely substantially separate program, all self-contained. And um, I think they sort of tipped off the people that were in that program about me and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> And they said the rule was we weren't allowed to go to school or to see the school. That's good. Maybe I should have thought that that was an issue. Um, but I, you know, I was still kind of young in this naive in this process. But one day I had to get my son for I think he, I had to bring him to the dentist. And somehow I don't think I went through the loops I should have done to pick him up. I think I may have just driven down there to pick him up to bring him to the dentist. And when I got there, I was horrified. Students were taking naps. There was another student watching a video. The teachers just seemed to be reading the paper. I was just, I was literally horrified at that point. And that's the point where, you know, my wife, and if, you, if my wife was here, she would tell you how she was the one that was moving this all along, and I was the one slow to the table. And she, she's right, because that, that, that's exactly what was happening. But once I saw that, I was like, oh my God, my wife's right. They're, you know, this is a disaster. But I think that's a point, that was a turning point for me that, that I figured no matter how hard me and my wife fought, we couldn't do it alone anymore. It's not possible for parents to move the system by themselves. And that's what I, and I was like at a loss. I was like, well, I don't know what to do. How do we do this? How do we move this forward? How do we get my son an education? And I was at one of my other kids' schools for open house, and there was a guy handing out papers. And the, the paper was for the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. How many people know what a Special Education Parent Advisory Council? How many don't? They don't want to raise your hand in the room. Um, special Education Parent Advisory Council is actually legislated under our special education law that says that each school district has to have an organization for parents to advise the school committee. So, and of course, I can say that now, I had no clue of what it was then, but all I remember is telling the guy is, you're exactly who I've been looking for. I need to do this. I want to get before your group and tell them the problem I'm having. And I remember getting up and giving the speech about the sort of what, kind of what we talked about here, and I, my speech was really a plea for help, is you need to help us. You need to help us get our kid educated. And at that time, we had school administration and we had the school committee, and everybody seemed willing to do that. Uh, and I was, of course, volunteering to be a part of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And for all of you who have ever been involved with a volunteer organization and said you want to get involved, the next step is they make you the head of it, right? <laughs> So I was now co-chair of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And then, of course, I don't know anything, So, but I'm a lawyer. They did train me something at law school. So I looked it up, and I said, well, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. So I looked up the thing, and it says, we're supposed to be advising the school committee. I said, do we do that? And they said, no. What do you mean? So what we did is we got on the agenda to advise the school committee. And we showed up, and I know we were not politically savvy at the time, and we kind of did some bad things, but we, the school committee was actually receptive, but in little towns, school committee hearings, even though they, people don't show up, they watch them on TV. Like everybody with a kid watches these things on TV. So we were up there for the first time saying, this is what's happening in your special education department. Here's the problems. Here's the things that we think need to be addressed. The school committee was very receptive to those conversations at that time. But we were now bringing this sort of movement out in the public. So uh, we had done that for a few years. And um, at one point, there was an opening on the school committee. There was a, a seat open. And um, someone had called me up who was on the school committee and said, we think you should run. How many people have been asked to run for office in this room? <laughs> nice. Did you? Yes. No. <laughs> My response was, I don't do that. <laughs> That's not for me. That's for somebody else. And I was happy with that answer. <coughs> uh, until I found out who else was running for school committee. 
And someone else who was running for school committee had done a lot of, I had actually worked with him as part of the Parent Advisory Council, and he was terrible, absolutely terrible on special education issues. And at the, the last minute, I thought to myself, I can't just sit back anymore, I just gotta do this. I got the signatures and got on the ballot. Once I was on the ballot, he actually decided not to run, so I got elected. That was my first foray into politics. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's how we start to move ahead. I don't know if I've gone way off the subject at this point. Um, but anyway, now I want to talk, I'll get into Alan's conversation. <laughs> oh, you've been great. <laughs> so uh, what happened was, as we continue to move through the system, and his education, even though I've made it sound in a lot of ways challenging, he was getting a great education at every step of the way absolutely phenomenal education. Um, by the time he, he went to high school, actually he went to the vocational high school, and the vocational high school is in our town is to go through like, um, they had like 15 different shops, they go to electrical, plumbing, horticulture, all this stuff. And he was in the regular system because he was included. Uh, when he went to that school, actually they, they didn't know us. And they said, oh, okay, we're just going to put him in this one shop. He's going to do like culinary, because that's what all the kids with special needs do is culinary. And, we're like, no. and uh, we want him to do all the shops. And then we go to the IEP meetings, and the guy who does the, I don't even know what it's called, but the big saws and everything says he can't do this because he's going to cut his fingers off. And everybody had an excuse why he couldn't do it, but we were persistent. And I think that the, the, the administration in that school actually had some thought about how to do this and they agreed to do the shops with us. So he did all the shops, he went through the whole system, did the shops, and actually ended up cho choosing horticulture, which is like landscaping, all this stuff, which he absolutely loves. He loves that. Um, they actually even went through as far as to teach him how to do small engine repairs for like long and small stuff, he did phenomenal. But as, as he was nearing the end of that term, I began to get nervous about what's next for him, because I didn't see a what's next. I didn't know what was next. And this will scare anybody who's ever thought of retaining me as a lawyer. Um, I didn't know what the law was on transition. I had no idea, so I thought to myself, this will scare you. I should represent someone in a transition case. That way I can learn what the law is. Well, he probably doesn't even know that part. <laughs> So I, um, somehow I got this case, I got this uh, young woman from Lincoln Suffering High School who this, their parent, her parents were saying um, didn't have a good transition plan. Her, she, was, um, she was like 19 or 20 at the time we started the, the case. Um, so I brought the case on. I did learn all about transition planning and somehow, I don't even remember exactly how I found you, Arlen. Either. I didn't know it was your first case. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was before Google or something. I don't know how it but I didn't find Arlen as an expert. And I came in and I talked to Arlen and we talked about it. And Arlen gave me the actual, you know, the 15 minute transition program. She talked about domains and how it's, in a simple way, and I can even still talk about this, is how do you bring someone from a K-12 system or from a school system to adulthood? Well, you think about, well, what does the person need to do as an adult? Well, let's look at social, the social domain. Everything was a domain. So what does the kid want to do in the social domain? Well, the kid likes to see movies. So you got to teach the kid, well, how do you go to a movie? Well, maybe I'll talk to my mom and dad. Maybe I'll talk to some friends. Maybe I'll go look it up in the paper to see what movies are there. Or maybe I'll Google it and see what movies are playing, and then I'll figure out how to get there and how to get there with a friend. There's no Google then. Yeah. I, well, know. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought it up. <laughs> um, so anyway, those are the types of things in all the domains. And one of the things that she talked about was self-advocacy. I think that was a big issue for us and a big issue for everybody. As you train someone to come from to being essentially a student, how do you teach them to advocate for themselves? What is that all about? <coughs> anyway, we went through the case. Arlen was a phenomenal witness, so if you need an expert witness, <laughs> she's the one. 
Um, she was very convincing. I remember her trial thinking, she's not saying everything I would like her to say exactly. Like as a lawyer, you want your witness to say, absolutely, blah, 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 blah. And Arlen would go, well, you know, this is important, that's important. And when they, you know, the other side would attack her opinion, she would say, well, yeah, that could be true. Um, ultimately, I think the decision was decided, I don't know if you remember this part of the decision, but the hearing officer, who was essentially the judge that decides these cases, gave Arlen so much credibility because she was willing to take off, to get off her stand. You know, she wasn't, uh, you know, taking a hard line approach. She was taking a realistic educator's academics approach to saying, how do you transition a kid? How is that meaningful? And the hearing officer thought, well, you know, sometimes in a, in a, in a trial, you, you have the idea of a hired gun. And she was saying, no, this person is really telling me about transition. Ultimately, the case was decided for the students, so we won. And she was, she acted, there's a sort of a lot of technical things, but essentially we won the case. And the, 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 the court actually laid out what it is that should be in a transition plan. So that the decision itself sort of laid that out. And this is a, I just want to bring this story up for, for maybe for administrators, maybe for a lot of people, but I need to, I think this story is well worth telling, especially for policymakers. Um, so one of the problems I had was, at this point we're trying to implement the plan for my son. I now know what the law is. I'm no longer faking the special education <laughs> lawyer thing. I actually know what the law is, and I was actually the trial attorney on the case that decided this particular area. At that time, I was also the chair of the Ashland School Committee. And at the time, I was actually doing corporate law, so I, we actually had financial resources, and what I wanted to do was partner with the school system to develop a real comprehensive education plan, transition plan for my son, to transition him to adulthood. And I don't really understand why, but they dug their heels in and were not doing it. As, as, as chair of the school committee under Massachusetts law, I had control of the superintendent. I could hire and fire the superintendent. The uh, special ed director works directly for the superintendent. So I am a person with the ultimate power in this process, and they wouldn't work with me to develop a transition plan. And I, I think the lesson of that is, is how if someone is in that position of power, even with the special education law we have, how can they not access services for their kids? That's, that's a huge takeaway. And that's, you know, I always hear in some of the conversations that special ed kids, they get everything, the laws are all geared for them. It's not that easy to access them. Um, ultimately what happened is, oh, I know what happened. I was elected official, so I actually had to call the ethics because I was like I, I have a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So I called the ethics of the state of Massachusetts, and I said, "Look, if this is the problem, I'm trying to get my kid educated, the school district's not budging. I'm the chair of the school committee." The woman, the lawyer at the other side, said, um, "Well, how old's your son?" I said, "He's 19 now." She said, "Have him sue you." So ultimately what happened is my son, through another lawyer in my office, filed suit against me and the school committee to enforce his rights for transition services. Oh, that's right. I, I, I have my expert witness. I do too. <laughs> so what happened in that case, once we sued in that case though, and maybe because they knew Arlen was there and they, and they went, once they bring a lawyer on in some of these special education cases, it takes the case out of the realm of the special ed director, and it gets more eyes on it. And once they looked at it, they said, no, this isn't, this isn't a good case for the district. We need to provide services. So ultimately, they provided services. It wasn't exactly what I really wanted. Um, we did move ahead. They did get a great education. and did get a great transition out to adulthood through a bunch of hoops. Ultimately, what this, my school district did is they created a transition program after the lawsuit. So they created what I wanted to create before the lawsuit, but it was just, you know, I don't know. It's very frustrating. So, oh, I just want to tell you about my son, Dave. 
now that we're... They've been seeing pictures of They've been seeing them. So Dave, Dave's awesome. Like I said, he's got a lot of talents. He was educated really for the most part, short of a couple of years, included with his typically developing classmates. And he's sort of the, um, I think he's like the poster child of what happens when you do that. So his expectations and the way he looks at the world is very different. Um, so he's very involved in politics, very involved in sports. Um, I, I don't know if you have a recent picture, but he's got the big Red Sox beard at this point. <laughs> Not the best looking beard. Um, but so he's, and he may actually be in town today. I don't know whether he actually came in town today for the duck boats or not. Um, but his expectations for himself were so different than a student that was not included all along the way. And, and in fact, when he turned, I think he was about, maybe he was 20, his younger brother got his driver's license. Um, and for some reason, Dave said, well, I want to get my driver's license. So, okay, you know, he, he, we had boats, and I talked to somebody, we have a sailboat, we have boats. He rode a bike, he's always been doing these things, you know, things that you didn't need a license for. He was always, he's just, he's very capable, like in a sort of spatial way. So that was, you know, it's okay. Um, and my son, other son, had this great uh, driving instructor, a young kid, who taught my other son how to drive, um, who just seemed phenomenal, laid back guy. So my wife went to him and said, oh, you know, can you teach my other son how to drive? And uh, she said, he has Down syndrome. And the kid said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure I can. I don't think the kid knew what Down syndrome was. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, actually, he passed the, um, the, the um, the permit part, because you were allowed to ask questions. He took it verbally, because he wasn't capable of doing the other one. So he took it, got his learner's permit, went driving with this guy, because we were really not so comfortable <laughs> driving with him. And he, did, um, he drove, um, he did like probably twice as much time as everybody else should have. And then his instructor called my wife and said, you know, I think he's ready for the test. I brought in, the instructor brought in his boss, because he had been driving with so much he wasn't sure. And he said, we all think he's ready for the test. So they brought him down for the test. Um, the only accommodation, and it wasn't a real accommodation, was that they brought like a lot of kids down for the test on a Saturday morning. And they put Dave, they had Dave take the test first so he didn't freak out waiting. So he took the test first, passed the test, and got his driver's license. Wow. But I think part of that is, is because of his ability to see, uh, to grow up in this sort of included world. Anyway, so he does well. He has his own business now. His business is actually doing much better. The economy's better. He does car detailing because he had a problem with poison ivy. And it says in my notes, it says, plug David's business. <laughs> <laughs> so his, if you want your car detailed, you can just go to his website, which is all in a Dave's work. <laughs> Remember that, dot com. So next, the transition bill. That you already heard a little bit about the transition bill on how it was started. It was started through Mass Advocates for Children, who brought together a group of folks, including Arlen and all sorts of policymakers and educators, to say, what, where's the sticking point? How do we get, what's a good thing that we can all agree on? They all agreed on um, transitions and, and working on the issue of transitions. And what they came up with is they came up with the idea of why you're here today to do, we originally called it a certificate, but to get some type of certificate or endorsement that says <laughs> these people would be qualified to provide transition services to students. Um, we, they, they came with a bill. Mass Advocates actually came to me. Um, I don't, there's a woman at Mass Advocates named Julia Landau. Does anybody know Julia here in the room? A lot of us know Julia. Joey and Pino's here as well yeah. from Mass Advocates. But Julia is a woman I've worked with a lot at the State House. And I refer to myself as the puppet and as to Julia as the puppet master. <laughs> so she came in with a transition bill, which was a little more complicated originally. Um, and I filed the bill, and I fought for it. And it didn't pass. And then last year, which must have been the year of the session we could have passed in, I decided to split the bill into two pieces because it seemed that one piece of the bill was holding up its passage. 
So when we split the bill into two pieces, we did a lot of wrangling, which include changing the, the word certification to endorsement. License to endorsement. So it did, you know, that didn't mean anything to me. We still do it. Um, but there was a whole lot of wranglings we went through to get that passed. <coughs> One of the things that we did was we had this event at the State House to draw our attention to the issue. And we had this event. The event was actually to, um, to bring self-advocates, educators, parents together to say this is what we need to do. What we did that day is we had it in room, a room in the State House, which is 437, which is not really handicapped accessible. Yeah. So we had it, we actually had, and I know you've seen these things. The room is about probably, I don't know, four feet higher than the level. Uh -huh. So in order to get there, they have this thing that's almost like an elevator and almost like a ramp. I'm sure you've seen it. You can take one person at a time up into the room. So we had about eight to 10 people in wheelchairs that day. Brought them all into the room, gave our rally. But part of what was happening with the ramp was a lesson of how we still have lots of barriers that exist for people, whether it's in education, whether it's in physical access. We have these laws in the books <clears throat> but the barriers still exist, and that we need to break down those barriers. We then had this 100-foot-long uh, petition that Matt had made, like literally 100 feet long, one piece of paper, um, that we presented to the governor. I don't think we had pictures it for that. Day. We rolled it all the way down the hall. The governor was very gracious, met with us, talked to the, a lot of the students that were there. Um, but that was the beginning of the excitement. We ultimately got the law passed, and that's why you're all here today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should leave because you just applauded. But <laughs> I'll just, all right, all right, so I'll just, I'll just, I have some other issues that are, or some other things that the legislators, legislature is working on that's really exciting and relevant to, to, I think, a lot of folks in this room. One is the Real Lives Bill. And the Real Lives Bill is because I feel that it's necessary because presently under the system we have, that if you're being funded by the Department <laughs> of Developmental Services, you're giving, they set a budget for you, but then they actually place you somewhere. They give you, they, they'll say, okay, you know, say it's for me, I go in, I get an evaluation, they say, okay, he needs help on a whole lot of domains to, to live an adult life. We're gonna budget him at say $40,000 in because I have these intellectual disabilities. So what happens is they budget me at $40,000 and then they look around the state and they say, okay, where's an opening for $40,000? All right, Tom, you're gonna go live in that house with those people and you're going to do this for a living if you're going to do that at all, and this is going to be your day program. So me and my family have no control over this process. As a matter of fact, if I get to that, if they place me in like a group home, and the group home's terrible, and I have had some experience with that, not with my own son, but with constituents, I have no way out of that group home. Because legally the contract is between the state and the group home. I'm just, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm just the object of the contract. So what the Real Lives Bill is change the dynamic. They start out the same way, they do an evaluation, they give me a budget, but now it's between me and my family to decide how do I spend that $40,000? How does that make sense for me? So I can have control over my own life for the first time. I can stay where I live, I can just have to decide if hire personal care attendants if I need it, if I need someone to come wake me up. I can choose what I do with my day. I can choose who I socialize with. It really puts the power in the person who's being served rather than in the department of the provider. Call your senators today. Find out who your state senator is and call them up and say, you want passage of this bill. I'm hoping the House the House side, I think, I already have assurances we can get it through, and I'm hoping to get it through in the next few weeks. 
but we need the Senate. So Google your senator, go to uh, mass.gov, you can find your senator, call them up and say you want the real Lewis bill. Maybe call on Monday because they're all at the parade. <laughs> yeah. Or you can leave a message. Do so they have a number on the bill? Um, no. I don't have 151. House 151. It's House 151. We must have filed it early to have a low number. There were um, more than 6,000 bills filed last year. We've got 151. One of the things to give you a, a sense of the support for that kind of legislation is when you file a bill, it gets signed on by um, members of the House or the Senate to support the bill. They call co-sponsors. A typical bill will have like, I don't know, 20 to 30 co-sponsors. If it's a solid bill, they'll get that many so co-sponsors. This bill, and I'm going to be wrong with the number, but I'll be close, I believe has 116 co-sponsors. There's huge support for this bill and to move this bill through. So anyway, that's one part, call your senators. The next thing I want to talk about is the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Program, which is a grant program. Some of you may know about it. Um, it's been operating here in Massachusetts as a is a grant program or a demonstration project for about the last seven years. And how the program works is um, local school authorities partner with a college or a university on the public side to concurrently enroll the student within the, the K-12 system as well as having the student take college classes in an inclusive model. Um, that's been tremendously successful, and we've seen great results from that across the state. We have Mary Price here, where are you? <laughs> Who's going to be talking this afternoon about uh, at Bridgewater State, so she'll, uh, she'll be talking about it today. She's probably at the Red Sox stand. The no, no, she's thinking she's, <laughs> she's, <laughs> thinking she's uh, so that's one big thing. Mary Price and the program at Bridgewater State is phenomenal. Um, is the, that leads me to the second piece. So the second piece is that we now have a task force. I'm chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And as such, I get to do things that I want to do. So what we did is we created a task force of 16 people with expertise in educating students with intellectual disabilities in higher education. So we have um, the chancellor, essentially the president of the University of Massachusetts system, the president of Bridgewater State University, we have members from the disability community and advocacy community. Um, we have a person on the um, on the board who uh, the task force who has Down syndrome who actually went through one of the programs. Um, and Elon Howe, who's the commissioner of DDS, is also on this task force. And we have four hearings across the state, really to get the conversation going of how do you include a student with intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities in higher education, and. There's some people in this room who are going to get what I'm talking about. The, the issue with this, I think, is that this is a very, very, very challenging concept for most people. And I liken it to one thing that I remember in my lifetime. How many in this room, and I'll embarrass everybody, were around before you had bank cards and bank <laughs> For those of you that weren't around then, when that started, they had all these commercials about, especially Bay Bank, I still remember the commercials where they'd have someone saying, oh, I gotta get to the bank. I gotta get to the bank. You know, they're gonna get married and go, well, I gotta get to the bank. The problem was that we as a public couldn't understand what they were talking about because the concept was so unique to us. We didn't understand you could take a card and go to a machine and you could work like a teller. That didn't make sense to us. So they had to educate the public around that field. That's what I feel like we're doing with this, including students with intellectual disabilities in higher education. Because you tell people, and they're you like, uh, I don't get it. So what we're doing, why we're having this task force, is by bringing this around the state to get people to talk about and think about how do we include students with intellectual disabilities. I have another great story I was going to tell, but maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> I'll tell really quick. Now. So um, we, I, I do advocacy work, obviously, and um, uh, my wife and I got an opportunity um, to go to Bangladesh um, to meet with an NGO that does work with people with intellectual disabilities. And part of why we went there, we were there was through a bunch of different relationships. 
was to help move Bangladesh as they were adopting the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we went there and we talked to lawyer groups. I talked at the University of Dhaka at law school. Uh, we met with parent groups. We met with self-advocates. Uh, we met with a number of member of parliament, members of parliament that were actually writing the new law and how they were going to do that. And what we were trying to do was shape their law to, you know, essentially my view to the, or conversation with the members of parliament was, you have an opportunity to do something really good, don't screw it up, here's some ways that we have screwed this up here. Mm -hmm. And they actually liked, they, they bought that conversation. But why I tell that story, Bangladesh, as you, most of you know, is a developing nation. Their economy right now is booming, but they are the most densely populated country in the world. Hmm. Um, to get anywhere is almost impossible. To get the, 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 the streets are clogged, the sidewalks are clogged, it's just amazing. And they really don't have a good sense of government. I think there's a lot of corruption in this. People steal electricity. You don't get, you don't have 24 hours of electricity a day. The power is typically off for, you know, <coughs> four or five hours a day. So I went there, you know, trying to give my advice or trying to help them. But I took away something very different. And I think that's what I want to end with is when I came back and I saw the struggles that they were having trying to implement special education policy and implement policy for people with intellectual disabilities in a developing nation with the, not the best resources to, to move this, but a nation that was growing fast, growing much faster and economically much stronger than we are here, what I took away was how tenuous it is where we are now. For the things that we do for folks with intellectual disabilities and the education <coughs> system we have, that if we don't continue to push the envelope ahead with things like Leslie's doing here today, if we don't continue to be vigilant with what we're supposed to be doing and how we move ahead for people with these disabilities to empower them in our society, we can easily slide back. So uh, I thank you all for being here. I thank you for your dedication and your work. And I need you, we all need you to continue to do this work and do it for all of us. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.